All right, good evening, everybody. Um, just opened up the webinar, we still have a few minutes. Um, glad to see attendees are sitting there waiting to come in. So thank you for coming and joining us tonight. We are going to be talking about rabbits and hares. Um, and tonight we are gonna be joined by Matt Meshery. He is an uh, uh, environmental scientist with our department and I'll introduce him in a little bit. We will be using the question and answer function for any questions that you have, please uh, post them there. Our panelists who are joining me tonight will be uh, helping us answer those questions. Some of them will be answered live during the webinar and some may be answered privately back to the person asking the question. So feel free to use that. Um, we have some polls that I'll be asking early on in the session just to see where you are as far as uh, your familiarity with rabbits and hares. So please participate in that. That really helps us as far as knowing um, what we're, material we're presenting and how you might take it or leave it. So uh, it's always a good, good idea for you to participate in our polls. So thank you for that ahead of time. Um, just so you know, there are some other webinars that are there on the web that are ready for registration. The next one I have is um, gonna be on, let me make sure, uh, July 8th, archery deer hunting. So if you're interested in archery deer hunting, uh, please sign up for that. And uh, the next one on July 22nd will be public A zone opportunities. So we're gonna try to cover all the public lands that are available in A zone, which is one of our largest zones in the state and try to give you some ideas of where you can go hunting. The tags are almost always available for that. And uh, so that could be a very uh, lucrative uh, webinar for you to attend. Um, one that's gonna be coming up in August, we're gonna have specifically for D11, 13, and 15. So if you have a D11, D13, or D15 tag, you'll be really wanting to, to join that in August. So, just letting you know of what some items are that are coming up in the future. Uh, so right now we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, at six o'clock, I'm gonna go ahead and start it with the poll here. And I'm gonna allow the panelists to vote. So here it goes. You'll notice that the second one is not really a poll, it's a joke. So you can answer it or not answer it. So here it goes. Have you ever hunted specifically for rabbits or hares? Uh, one is yes, two is no, three is no, only taken rabbits or hares incidental to other hunting. <laughs> the joke, what do you call a group of rabbits hopping backwards? A receding hairline. Funny or not funny? <clears throat> I'm laughing. I had to do it because thinking of rabbits, you think of Bugs Bunny and all the funny cartoons you watched when you were a kid. So here we go, we'll go ahead and close it in another two seconds and end polling, share my results. All right, so some people have, 50% uh, have harvested um, rabbits that have gone out specifically. 34% um, have not hunted rabbits or hares. And then 16% have harvested them incidental to other hunting. And you guys did like my joke. I just pulled that off the internet, just trying to keep it nice and live. So we'll see what happens. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a new poll. This one will be on harvest. So go ahead and answer this. I have taken in, in my hunting lifetime, cottontail, this is multiple choice, mark all those that you have, jackrabbit, snowshoe hare, or none of the above. Okay, and my choke is how can you tell rabbits are getting old? You look for the gray hairs. All right, a couple of you guys don't like my jokes. That's fine. And here we go. We're gonna end polling, and share the results. All right, so there's only a couple of sour faces there. <clears throat> there's three for my jokes. I'm just kidding. I like y'all. And uh, most people have hunted, 52% have, uh, taken cottontail, 40% have taken jackrabbit. Nobody's taken the show snowshoe hair, so we got some uh, work cut out for us, Matt. And 
42% have taken nothing, none of the above. So you are also here for the right reasons. I really do appreciate you coming. All right. So let me stop sharing my thing. I did that. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, which is going to show our rabbit. Oops, let me do this first. And share my screen. So where is it? Second screen. Okay. All right, can anybody tell me which screen you're showing? Matt, can you tell me which uh, screen is being show, shown? So I see, uh, I see your slideshow and just uh, the uh, participants on the right bar. Okay, so I'm a, I am the whole big one, not the creator, right? Uh, I see oh. your, I also see your slides on the left side, Sean. Okay, let me change that then. This is what's hard about Zoom. There's, it cuts some screens off and then leaves some behind. Uh, I, uh, I've been having luck with Shift F5. Shift F5. The change? No, it, it did not change. Golly, you think I've been doing this for a little while? All right, let me try it again. There it is. Zoom is very finicky. You should have it now, correct? Yep. All right. So here we go. So we're going to talk about rabbits and hares and what for you to know, um, what to know for, for pursuing these animals. Um, here on the, the slide, you can see there's a cottontail. In the middle is a jackrabbit. And on the right-hand side is a snowshoe hare. Uh, actually, jackrabbits are considered hares. We'll figure out what, what designates a, them as hares versus rabbits. Matt will cover that. And just to let you know who our um, presenter is tonight, it's, he's CDFW, it's Fish and Wildlife. He works with the Santa Maria Mail scientist, Matt Neshery. There's his uh, degrees, what he's been doing with his life. He's worked on his bachelor's, his master's, and he's focused on ecology, animal behavior, and physiology. Uh, he spent some time banding uh, spotted owls. He's been a research associate with UC Berkeley in the forest and working for USGS as a lead investigations for the gar giant garter snake. Probably worked here in the valley a little bit. Um, he's been with us since 2012, and he has nine years in the Upland Game Program Department. Um, statewide coordination with a focus on resident small game and mammals, predator communities, and resident upland game birds. So he is an expert in his field. So let me go ahead and turn over the screen to you, um, Matt, and let's hopefully have uh, no hangups like I did. Okay, I'm going to try to enter here. Oops. How's this look? You got to share it. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Sometimes if you press share and then unshare and share again, it'll come up. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. If, if you can't get it up, I still have it. Where, uh, where am I looking for the uh, share screen? Oh, there it is, okay. Uh, I think I got it, all right. Very, yep. So I see your email. Okay. It's uh, not what I want. Let's see. We practiced this earlier uh, <laughs> a couple of days ago. Uh, I think I, I think I gotta get it here. Okay. Yeah. Now we just need to put it on uh, 
to the uh, the slideshow. How's that? There you go. Thank you. Okay, it's all yours. Excellent. Well, thanks for the introduction, Sean. Um, happy to be with you guys tonight to talk about rabbits and hares. Um, this is the family Leporidae. Um, <clears throat> they're a, a, a keystone prey species for a lot of different predators, uh, mammalian and avian. And that means that without them, those predator communities can't exist. So they're, they're a really important component in those ecosystems. Uh, sorry, I clicked my next slide. They're also an important game species for humans. And so tonight I wanted to give you just an overview of the species that occur here in California. I'm gonna focus on our native species. And then I wanna provide maybe a little historical perspective on uh, what are documented declines in rabbit populations in the West over the past 50 years. I'll touch uh, just a bit on how climate and fire uh, will impact these rabbit populations looking ahead. And, and like we said, I'll touch on some relevant zoonotic disease information. And zoonotic diseases are, of course, diseases that affect animals and humans. Um, so first I'll talk about the cottontails and then I'll talk about the hare. Um, the desert cottontail rabbit is the most commonly encountered rabbit in the state. Uh, it occupies a majority of the state um, from the deserts on all the way up through the Great Valley and on the east side of the Southern uh, Sierra. The species is a habitat and a dietary generalist and uh, it can make a living in a wide variety of habitats, uh, similar to the black-tailed jackrabbit, which we'll talk about. It occupies the southern desert region uh, into grasslands, riparian zones, and even up to heights of 6,000 feet in uh, pinyon juniper forests, where you can find this rabbit sometimes climbing into pinyon juniper to, to get at berries, actually. These rabbits use burrows that are excavated by other animals. And uh, in terms of identifying them, like all cottontails, they've got the, the white tail um, dark above. And like other cottontails, they can use this round white tail as an alarm signal uh, if they're angry or uh, alarmed, they'll uh, flash that tail up and down and other individuals that might be feeding in the same area uh, can take that as a sign that there's something potentially wrong. Um, these rabbits eat primarily grasses. 90% of their diet is grasses. And we know that grasses are not a high quality food item. And to get around this low nutritional value, they've adapted to be, um, so I get my laser pointer on to be uh, uh, coprogenic, uh, which, which uh, from the Latin means uh, dung eating. So copro for dung and phagic for mouth, dung eating. And so what they do is their, their first fecal pellet that comes out is very moist, still has a lot of nutritional value. They re-ingest that first pellet typically and the second time the pellet comes out, it'll be very dry and compacted. These are the types of pellets that you see when you're out looking for sign. Um, they extract a lot of additional nutrition that way. They obtain almost entirely all their water from the plants and the grasses that they consume. And, uh, and so, when we consider a warming climate, it's, 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 it's important to note that as the climate warms a degree or two degrees, uh, the daytime high temperatures in our Southern desert regions actually go up quite a bit more than that, maybe three times that in the daytime. As a, so a six degree rise during the daytime hours. So that's something that'll 
that'll put some pressure on the southern populations of this animal eventually. Uh, something to think about. Uh, these guys are altricial. Uh, this is a, again, a Latin word. In this case, it means to nourish. So uh, when the young are born, they're pink and hairless and pretty much completely dependent on the mother for a period of about a month. And this is something that we'll see distinguishes the cottontail rabbits from the hares that we'll talk about later, like the jackrabbit. Um, <clears throat> this species is uh, sort of social among cottontail rabbits. Uh, they don't share burrow systems like the European rabbits, so they're not social in that way. But like I said earlier, they'll, you'll find them out foraging together. So they tolerate their neighbors and they typically forage in the morning or in the late afternoon. Uh, being an arid adapted species, that's the time of day to be out. Also the time of day to avoid a lot of predators, uh, avian predators, uh, other mammals that are gonna avoid the heat. Um, let's see, so when they uh, see a predator, uh, their first instinct is to freeze in place and to try and avoid even being detected. And upon deciding that they're in danger and they need to escape, they'll uh, escape in a zigzag pattern and they can run it up to 20 miles an hour. And you may have seen this in front of your car driving down a dirt road at some point in the evening. Um, these rabbits have what we would describe as two color vision, uh, similar to color blindness in humans. And so they see shades of, of, of color, but something like blaze orange is, is not gonna register with a rabbit, whether, you know, is anything different, so something to note. Uh, there's no penalty for wearing blaze orange when you're hunting rabbits. Um, pretty much everything preys on these cottontail rabbits, including uh, coyotes, foxes, bobcats, uh, badgers, weasels, red-tailed hawks, golden eagles, great horned owls, even uh, rattlesnakes and large gopher snakes. And believe it or not, uh, crows and ravens are a significant predator as well, particularly for nests and for young that, that, that may be discovered in the nest. Um, these guys have, these desert cottontails have high reproductivity. They have high reproductive output and they're able to breed uh, from eight months of the year to year round, depending on location. They don't have the reproductive output of the European rabbit, but they're not far off. Um, I'll, I won't talk about the European rabbit today. It, it does occur in locally in areas within the state, but I don't, I'm not aware that there's sustaining populations in the state. Um, these rabbits have generally uh, small home ranges, but the uh, Males have a larger home range than the females. And, uh, and their eyesight's really only good to about 100 feet. So they won't see you approaching past that, past that uh, threshold. Uh, the next rabbit I wanted to talk about is the mountain cottontail rabbit. And so we saw in the previous distribution that the desert cottontail occupied the southern and central valley. Uh, the cottontail is not found at the highest elevations in the Sierra, but if you were to go up over the top of the Sierra at about 10,500 feet on the other side, you'd start to pick up this mountain cottontail species. <clears throat> uh, this rabbit is roughly the same size as the desert cottontail. It occupies the, as I said, the east side of the Sierra Nevada. So that's where you find sagebrush. <clears throat> and this rabbit's considered a sagebrush specialist. So a great proportion of its diet is sagebrush. And that's the type of habitat that it would typically be found in. 
Uh, sagebrush is interspersed with junipers and, and, and these guys will take advantage of the junipers as a resource as well. The mountain cottontail is generally solitary, whereas the, you'll find the desert cottontail sometimes feeding together with neighbors. Uh, this animal is generally solitary, not a social forager. It uh, occupies, again, a variety of habitats. <clears throat> it's a generalist in terms of its habitat requirements. Uh, it, it likes brush or wooded areas, especially near riverbanks. And it'll take advantage of those wet loving grasses and willows. Sage, sagebrush is, is uh, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more of a widely available resource. So that's where you'll generally find them anywhere there's sagebrush. Um, they can also use uh, rock crevices as burrows, but they'll use burrows excavated by other animals similar to the desert cottontail. <clears throat> you can tell the mountain cottontail apart from the desert. Um, it's, it's, its hairs are more dense. It's got a denser coat, <clears throat> particularly around the, the, the rump. So, <clears throat> So the, the reddish brown hairs on the back legs are stiff and dense and cover the whole rear leg. Uh, the ears are shorter than the desert cottontail and those, those tips are more rounded and they're also black, uh, black tipped. Uh, a lot of the same predators that are gonna prey on the desert cottontail are gonna prey on the mountain cottontail, but certainly less crows, probably less ravens at these altitudes. Um, interestingly, where it occurs, uh, the American pine marten is a, is a predator of the mountain cottontail. Uh, moving to the next species, I'll talk about the brush rabbit. The brush rabbit is a smaller rabbit. It's a cottontail. It's a habitat specialist and it occupies riparian corridors uh, of tributaries of most of the major rivers around the state. It, it lives its, its life in this really dense vegetation, this thicket-like vegetation that grows in these corridors and it'll climb up into that vegetation. It's a good climber. So it's often not on the ground, but up climbing in this vegetation, foraging. It very rarely leaves that type of cover. Uh, when it does, it'll only be for maybe a, a meter. It, it likes to sun in, uh, in openings. Uh, so if you're lucky enough, you might find it sunning close to cover in the middle of the day. Um, but this, but this rabbit, like I said, doesn't venture out of this cover and it's, it's, not, it's not a good runner. It doesn't have good dispersal abil abilities. And for these reasons, it's somewhat vulnerable to flood events. Uh, it relies on vertical escape cover uh, when, when rivers and tributaries rise. It has to have enough upland habitat to find refuge under those conditions. There's a lot of different subspecies, eight of them that occur around the state of this, of this brush rabbit. Uh, and those are associated with different watersheds and the different vegetation that occurs in those different watersheds. The brush rabbit, like I said, said is this, well, I said it was small. It's the smallest common rabbit that you'll encounter in California. It's just slightly larger than the pygmy rabbit, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, has small hind feet, brown fur, very uniform brown fur on the ears as well. It doesn't have those black tips. The underside is gray, so a less striking coloration. And the tail is usually carried kind of down and it's small and inconspicuous. Um, 
these are the things that would, otherwise it looks much like the desert and the mountain cottontail. So habitat will tell you a lot about what type of rabbit you're looking at, particularly if you have a juvenile. Um, uh, predators of this species, as you might imagine, are less of the avian. So the, the hawks and um, owls are a, are a, are a threat, uh, but this, uh, this brush rabbit is particularly active in the twilight, and that, that's when owls would be a big threat. Um, but believe it or not, one of the biggest predators of these animals, which are not particularly large, again, they're maybe a pound and a half, are mountain lions and bobcats, because the mountain lions and bobcats use those same corridors that this species uses for habitat as, as movement corridors. And so this is just an opportunistic snack for uh, cats that are moving through these riparian corridors. And if, if they catch one of these guys up in a, uh, up in some vegetation foraging, uh, you can imagine it would be pretty easy for a cat to take advantage of that opportunity. Of those eight subspecies of brush rabbit in the state, um, one of them is endangered. Um, like I said, they're, they're active in the twilight and they have low reproductive output. Uh, this, this particular cottontail only breeds in the, in the spring. So they have, they have one breeding opportunity during the year, whereas the desert and the mountain can, under good conditions, mount, uh, reproduce almost year round. Uh, this rabbit's only reproducing in the spring. And so it only can produce about three or four uh, litters a year and those litters are only three or four individuals so it's got a low reproductive output uh, puts it at a bit of a disadvantage and and this is part of the reason that we have one species in the state now that is uh, uh, federally and state endangered this is the riparian brush rabbit um, u.s Fish and Wildlife Service began captive breeding, uh, an experimental, uh, I'm sorry, captive breeding a, a population of this uh, species in 2001 in an attempt to have uh, uh, an, an experimental population that would be protected in the event that flooding or fire took out the small populations that do exist in the wild. Uh, in 2005, they reintroduced some of these captive individuals to the wild to create another population to lessen that risk of extinction. And this is a uh, map from a status review of this uh, endangered subspecies of brush rabbit. Uh, and so we can see here, uh, this is the, uh, this is Tracy and the, uh, 580 corridor as it comes up to, to five here. This is the experimental population that's now called the, um, um, well, it's, I think it's called the, the, north, the north population of this, of this species distribution. Uh, and then there's the South Delta population, which is what they call uh, the animals that have been reintroduced down here at the San Joaquin National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, these blue dots here uh, lead up to um, uh, a, state, a state area that used to have uh, rabbits that were likely taken out during flooding events in the mid-2000s. Caswell Memorial Park is the red dot, and um, it's believed that those they, rabbits don't exist in that location at this, at this time. So it's a, a species that has a precarious future, uh, but a lot of efforts underway. And you can uh, learn more about those through, through our website. Um, I'll move on to the next species and final cottontail I'm gonna talk about. And this is the pygmy rabbit. 
the smallest cottontail. Um, you can see that their distribution in California is, is very limited in this map. And in reality today, the only populations that we know of that occur in the state uh, right here at Mono Lake. Um, this rabbit is both a habitat and a dietary specialist. It is also associated with uh, sagebrush that occurs on the east side of the Sierra. And it, it, it digs its own burrows, but it requires certain types of soil to do that. Loose, uncompacted soils, you could describe them as loamy soils. These are, these are the bottoms of old uh, water drainages that are uh, long gone. Um, and so they have very specific habitat requirements. You can see in this next slide, uh, I've included a map from a, a paper uh, from the mid 2000s. And this was where the authors had gone out and intensively surveyed past known locations of this species. Those are the white dots, the past known locations. And these black dots are where they actually found rabbits in the mid 2000s. And so you can see that populations that occurred in California and Lassen County that were known of in the 1980s uh, we're, we're, no, we're not identified at that time. And we haven't identified any additional populations since this time. Um, you can see that, that our population that occurs around Mono Lake is, is separated quite a bit from um, the next closest populations. And that has to do with these soils. They just, they, they only kind of make out the tributary bottoms here from old, waterways. And so uh, they just don't occur in an even pattern on the landscape. And so these rabbits are found where only that occurs. And those type of soils occur out here in uh, Nevada, uh, in what we call the Great Basin ecosystem. Uh, the Great Basin covers Nevada, touches portions of Eastern California, extends down into the Southern deserts of our state and a little further east. It's bordered on the east side by the Colorado Rocky Mountains. It's a province uh, that has very similar plant communities throughout. And because of that, it has um, very similar uh, animal assemblages too. And so this pygmy rabbit is associated with this Great Basin ecosystem. Like the uh, riparian bush rabbit, it likes to stay near cover. It'll move in and around and underneath sagebrush thickets and uh, use those to escape to a burrow. Um, as, as we uh, experience um, partially due to climate change, but largely due to effects of past ranching activity here in the Great Basin, uh, we're starting to see that uh, where we used to have sagebrush, we're beginning to get encroachment of juniper trees. And uh, this changes the quality of that habitat for a lot of the animals that live there. It's a particular problem for sage grouse. You may be familiar with it in that context. Um, the encroachment of junipers along with exotic non-native grasses that came along with uh, cattle ranching such as cheat grass are now occupying and increasing their, their representation in that habitat. And so those exotic grasses act as fuels for fire at a, at a more intense and larger scale. And the juniper acts as a, as a ladder and a accelerating, you know, as a particularly, uh, as a fuel for a particularly hot fire. So those, fires that we're starting to experience are, are more, more, more catastrophic and hotter and affecting vegetation in ways that they used to not. So fire suppression and grazing have been big factors for the pygmy rabbit. Still doing well in a lot of its range, but in California, uh, just an isolated population there around Mono Lake. 
Uh, this rabbit is not particularly active during the day. You won't find it until the twilight. So unless you're, uh, you know, looking to encounter it, you probably wouldn't. So that's it for the cottontail rabbits. I'm going to talk about the black-tailed jackrabbit now, which is our first hare. This is the most widely uh, distributed uh, uh, ligomorph or, or uh, rabbit in the state. It um, occupies heights up to 10,000 feet. It, in it inhabits most all of the areas that you're going to find the desert cottontail. Uh, plus, it's higher and, it, and it's all the way up into the north of the state. This, this hare can exist in just about any habitat. Um, it's probably most preferred habitat are the deserts and grasslands of the southwest, uh, which it ex its range extends all the way out into the southwest and it enjoys those mixed shrub grasslands where there's lots of resources and lots of open and rocky terrains. Uh, this species enjoys rocky terrains when it needs to escape predators, uh, like the desert cottontail evades in a zigzag pattern. Uh, however, this hare will, will jump obstacles while it's zigzagging. It'll look for obstacles to jump because it's got incredible leaping capability and uh, the ability to attain uh, speeds of up to 40 miles an hour in bursts, but only in bursts. Uh, this animal has low endurance, so black-tailed jackrabbit's strategy is to evade the predator initially uh, and and find uh, and basically lose lose the predator. Uh, the, the, um, lose, shake the predator off of its trail. If it can't do that within a short period of time. Uh, that's when uh, predators are likely to take jackrabbits and predators take a lot of jackrabbits. There's jackrabbits all through the state and they're food for eagles, hawks, coyotes, foxes, uh, and wild cats. And you can imagine uh, this, this animal is a, a three to six pounds, a bit of a prize for a mid-sized mammal. Um, these, these can grow up to two feet in length. Um, they're active during the day and during the twilight hours. So uh, we tend to encounter black-tailed jackrabbits quite a bit if we're out in their habitat looking for them. Um, like I said, the, one of the distinctions between rabbits and hares is how the young are born. And, and the young of the black-tailed jackrabbit are born fully furred. And um, Within days, they can kind of be off on their own. They'll tend to hang out close to the mother for a month for protection and maybe for some education, but uh, they're basically able to operate on their own almost out of the gates. And so this is what we refer to as altricial from the Latin to nourish. Uh, uh, it's al without nourishment. So in this case, it's like the opposite of uh, nourishing. Um, and uh, like I said, one of the most one of the most widely distributed species and one that you, you tend to see a lot. Uh, a lot of jackrabbits, not as many as the old days, and we'll talk about that in a second. But right now I'll move on to the other jackrabbit that's native to California, the white-tailed jackrabbit. This again is a species associated with that sagebrush on the east side of the Sierra. This uh, species has declined significantly throughout its range in the past 50 years, more so than the other rabbits that we're talking about today. Um, they're nocturnal. Uh, so they're awake at night and out foraging and taking care of business. Uh, they're also crepuscular, crepuscular from the Latin meaning twilight. So they're active in the twilight and at night and they're solitary and they have good mobility and larger home ranges. 
Um, you can see this individual here has got a sort of a, a half white and half gray brown coat. It looks like it's, it's going into the summer, uh, spring and summer. So it's starting to get some color. Uh, it, during the winter, they will be pure white. And by the late summer, uh, they'll, they'll have achieved a full uh, gray-brown coat. So they do, uh, they do change their coat with the seasons. Hey, Matt, there's a question uh, regarding black-tailed jackrabbits. Are their yeah. numbers stable? Um, or are they in decline? I mean, if I had to say, I'd say they're in decline. I mean, uh, we'll talk. We'll talk about. They're certainly in decline. You know, if we go back far enough. I mean, I'm not sure which time frame we're talking about, but you know, honestly, even in the shorter time frames, um, we're in the middle of a extended period of drought. Um, you know, we had that uh, really intense five years of drought, but. The truth is we've, we've been in a sort of a couple periods of drought that have strung together since about 2000, 2001. And um, habitat conditions aren't, too, aren't great and uh, we could really use some wet years. So I would say that black-tailed jackrabbits are probably at lower levels right now. Okay, thank you. Um, so this guy changes his coat annually. Um, <clears throat> we don't tend to know, we, we don't know much about uh, white-tailed jackrabbits that do occur in the state. And there aren't too many that, that do occur in the state. And then it probably depends in some part on uh, what type of winter we're having and, and maybe even whether we've had a couple of good winters strung together uh, to where we would have any good populations occupying this, this habitat in our state. Um, they here in, in California can get up to 10 pounds. This would be considered the Southern part of their range. They occupy that entire uh, Great Basin ecosystem that we saw in the previous map. And they go even further North up into Canada. So they occupy parts of the Northern parts of Saskatchewan and at those northern parts of their range, they can actually be twice as large up to uh, individuals have been documented at close to 20 pounds. Um, so like I said, they, they, they're a great basin adapted species. They like open prairie, native prairie with native uh, grass species. They also use alpine meadows and that's probably where we're most likely to have them here in our state. Um, and then the tundra up in the northern part of their range. Um, they like that sagebrush step. And um, so in this next image, uh, we've got a rabbit that's in its full winter coat against the dark background. Um, the Native Americans, when they occupied the Great Basin uh, used fire quite a bit to keep the landscape open. And they did that here in California too, in the, in the uh, coastal mountains and in the foothills uh, with, uh, with a variety of oaks. Uh, they would keep that habitat open underneath the oaks or, or uh, open up, you know, burn off old uh, vegetation in the prairie and increase the uh, productivity of the land. And so there's some thought that at the time that Westerners encountered these species of the Great Basin that the white-tailed jackrabbit in particular was enjoying habitat conditions that were very optimal and haven't been uh, that way probably since that time. Uh, with the arrival of Westerners and uh, particularly grazing, but agriculture to a certain extent. And now uh, the effects of some of the introduced grass species. And like we talked about with the juniper encroachment, those types of things are really changing these open habitats that this species relies on. Um, those, are the, those are the main reasons we're seeing such dramatic declines, I think, uh, 
with the white-tailed jackrabbit. It's um, some concern throughout the West, uh, different degrees in different states. Um, this animal being active at night and in the twilight is not uh, an animal that you'd probably be able to target. Uh, you'd be lucky to encounter in the state, but I wanted to present it to you because it is a, a native inhabitant of California and a really interesting pair uh, that it's, uh, I would love to see a 20 pound specimen, yeah. <laughs> quite an animal. So what a family of 10. <clears throat> yeah, no doubt. So then we go from, from that, that fellow to the, the snowshoe hare, which is a much smaller rabbit, uh, not much larger than the desert cottontail, uh, about three pounds on average, maybe less than that. Um, the uh, soles of the hind feet are covered in dense, stiff hairs, giving the snowshoe hare its name. Um, in its uh, summer coat, uh, it also changes like the uh, white-tailed jackrabbit with the season, but in its summer coat, it has a, uh, a sort of a nape on the back of its neck that, that can be used to identify it, uh, a, a sort of a brown, uh, dark stripe on the back of its neck. Um, this species, depending on the habitat conditions, um, at rare times when conditions are really good, um, and there's a lot of forage and they're in the breeding season. Uh, you might see these guys active during the day and in large numbers. Uh, under certain conditions, they can be really tolerant of other individuals in their area. Um, their predators include the usual suspects, coyote, fox, wolf, great horned owls, uh, being as they're a more northern species, northern goshawks are a significant predator of the snowshoe hare. But uh, the single most significant predator of the snowshoe hare uh, is the lynx, the Canadian lynx. Uh, very similar to the bobcat that occurs here. Uh, but you can see that we here are really at the very southern extent of the range of the snowshoe here. So where they occur in California, they're obviously not being preyed on by lynx, they're being preyed on by bobcat and those other predators I talked about. Uh, note that they do range all the way up into Alaska. And the lynx uh, likewise covers that same distribution. And so, the relationship between the Canadian lynx and the snowshoe hare has been a sort of a case study for students of biology, like myself, uh, in what we call predator-prey dynamics, in which uh, a predator uh, you know, decreases the population of the prey and the, until the prey is gone, and then the population of the predator crashes. And it's probably the best example of this phenomena that, that we have. Here we can see a graph and in red are populations of snowshoe hare through the years and in blue populations of lynx through the years. And you'll note that the spikes in populations of, of the hare are followed by spikes in populations of the lynx and that they then both crash because the lynx quickly exhaust all that prey. And, uh, and so this is um, a cycle that results from variation in mortality of the snowshoe hare, but the cycle has been studied quite a bit. It also involves things like the fact that these hares have variable reproductive output that depends in part on the food quality of the items that they're able to access. And also that when the rabbits get to high population levels, uh, they're interacting socially quite a bit and that's very stressful and creates stress hormones that decrease their fitness. Um, and, and finally, things like the North Atlantic Oscillation, uh, which is a, is a something a weather pattern, something similar to El Nino and that it's cyclical and it changes the temperature of the, of the uh, climate for brief periods of time. 
Um, all of these things add up to this seven to 10 year cyclical uh, pattern that we see in the snowshoe hair and the lynx. And we're lucky to have this uh, information. This comes from uh, fur trapping records from the Hudson Bay Fur Company. And so this is uh, uh, an amazing opportunity to, to, to get to be able to identify this pattern and, and, and make sense of it. Uh, so more reading for you if you're interested in that. Uh, we're interested to know if you cite a snowshoe. It sounds like nobody has yet, but um, you know it's the type of thing that would probably happen in, under the right conditions. And like I said, under a period of good snow years, we have a reporting mechanism on our website under the conservation period pages, or if you Google it, you'll find it. Uh, so please do let us know if you, if, or, or if you know of anyone, direct them that way. So that's, those are our native uh, rabbit species uh, and hares, the two, three hares that occur in the state. I wanted to probably at this point, um, change gears a little bit and, um, and talk about a, a little bit of a historical uh, perspective on these, these populations in the West of all of these species, really. I was contacted by this author a few years ago, David Brown. He was working on this paper that looked at the history of populations of, of a variety of, of, of rabbits and hares in the West. And uh, what they did was collected also all the harvest data that they could find from all the Western states that would participate and also other uh, random bits of data that they were able to gather. Um, and they used this all to sort of uh, reconstruct as best they could what maybe the population, uh, the, the populations had looked like through time. Uh, one of the things that the paper points out is that uh, both rabbits and hares were a really important food source for early settlers. Um, even after settlement, um, rabbits were still an important source of protein for folks that uh, didn't have a lot of money. This was a time when there was market hunting still. And so uh, you could probably buy jackrabbit on the open market for much less than beef. Uh, a lot of people did. Uh, but by the time the 20th century, the 1800s were winding down and we're getting into the 20th century, uh, agriculture had become very widespread. Uh, ranching was picking up and these rabbits and hares uh, became mostly considered pests. They competed with farmers for uh, crops and also uh, for forage um, with the livestock. And so this is the reason these these, jack, these rabbits as well uh, would, um, there would be what was described as eruptions at the time of, of jackrabbits in particular, but uh, this was in response usually to good uh, growing conditions. Um, but these jackrabbit eruptions became more frequent and greater in scale as time went on and, and there was more resources in the landscape due to agriculture and due to ranching. And so in response to these eruptions, and we see some old, an old picture of an eruption here, uh, landowners and uh, even municipalities uh, would organize bounties uh, for it and, and drives to round up these rabbits. And um, There's, some, there's actually some uh, movie footage of some of these drives out on the internet. You can look for it. Uh, it they continued into the 1900s. Uh, really interesting. They're described as the ground just crawling with rabbits. And this also coincided with the Dust Bowl in the 1930s out in the Great uh, Plains. And so in some of these drives, it's recorded that tens of thousands of rabbits were rounded up in single drives. These drives and bounties largely ended by the 50s. Uh, one thing that led to that was in 1915, the uh, US government 
developed the branch of predatory animal and rodent control within the agriculture department. And that department began to really favor the use of, of toxicants and poisons for controlling rabbits and also uh, avian and, and terrestrial predators, coyotes, eagles, hawks. And so uh, the, the time of, of these roundups and bounties uh, pretty much came to an end by the 50s. And, and in the Western states, including California, um, these chemicals continue to be in use up until in some cases, the 1980s. Uh, we know that DDT was discontinued in 1972 and that's the reason that we were able to recover the bald eagle. Uh, some of these chemicals here were still in use into the 80s. And, um, you know, up until this time, uh, I'll say that, you know, the last uh, major uh, jackrabbit, uh, well, in this case, jackrabbit, well, the last major rabbit eruption of any kind occurred that was documented, uh, occurred in Southern Idaho in 1980. And so, you know, at that time, there was still a belief that maybe these eruptions were uh, sort of inherent to jackrabbits, like uh, part of their natural cycle. Um, a lot of this thinking is due to what we have observed in the uh, snowshoe here. Um, but as time's passed, and we're now 40 years out from 1980, we've never seen another eruption of, of rabbits, jackrabbits or, or, or cottontails in North America since. And so it's become pretty widely accepted that these eruptions were the result of uh, initially um, probably improvement in the landscape in terms of the benefits of, of early agriculture and early ranching with, with forage being out on the landscape. And then later, um, the, uh, the product of pre uh, predator suppression. So um, those are believed now to be the reasons for these eruptions. And so you can see with this in mind, um, num numerically, uh, rabbit populations and particularly jackrabbit populations have been declining in the last 50 years. But it's, uh, you know, some of it's bad when we think about what's going on in the Great Basin with the sagebrush ecosystem, and certainly with climate change and in the desert, uh, the ability of rabbits to persist in some of those really arid habitats. And some of it is probably due to historical happenstance. But I wanted to paint out that picture a little bit for you. And um, with that, I think I'm, I'm done presenting on the biology of our native uh, uh, species. And my next slides are to do with uh, some disease issues that we have going on in the state. Going to roll right into that, Sean? Yeah, with a little bit more uh, pace because we still got some stuff to cover okay. and we want, we want them to not uh, leave us. So we want to be able give them a whole program so okay get them going okay <laughs> so we might you might rhdb2 is this new virus that uh is in the news right now it's a new form of an old virus that was first in detected in china in 2010 uh, a new form of it emerged in france and it began to spread really rapidly in 2015 it, it it entered Australia and crossed the continent in 18 months, replacing the old uh, virus. And it was detected here in California in May of uh, 2020. You might wonder, RHDV2, it's called a calivirus. You might wonder if it's anything like a coronavirus. Interestingly, it looks something like a coronavirus. Here's the coronavirus. It's a very large virus, which is unusual. Most viruses are much smaller. This thing is covered in what look like flower petals. Uh, and so that's why it's called a calivirus. Cali meaning calyx of a flower in uh, Greek or Latin. Um, but another interesting thing about this virus is that uh, while it's able to enter the body in a soft, uh, moist state, uh, it can dry out into a, a sort of a dry golf ball, like what we're seeing over here. This is an electron micrograph of some dry virus. And the, this, in this dry, encapsulized state, it can persist in the environment. 
for quite a long time. It's highly contagious among uh, all leporids. And it's not known to affect dogs or livestock or humans, which is uh, a plus, um, but we don't know that much about it yet. It's spread by contact with any type of fluid, uh, also skin cells or dander, uh, so you can breathe it in. Um, like I said, it persists. It can persist uh, uh, for three months on a cloth or on a carcass under field conditions. And in rabbits, it causes pretty rapid death, uh, often with no sign, but sometimes with bleeding around the nose or mouth, swelling and internal organ damage. Being as it persists in the environment, one of the most important things we can do is be aware of where it is occurring and clean our gear, particularly our footwear, if we're gonna be moving from location to location. Um, you can find out where it is. This is a map, the most recent data from June 10 um, in affected counties. This is both domestic and wild rabbits represented here, but most of these counties have had wild cases now. It moves pretty readily between domestic and wild populations uh, for the reasons that I described. Here's a question, Matt, it's a pretty good one. Uh, is it possible to test the harvested game meat before consumption by the hunter? What, what would the, what would the oh. hunter recognize as a, being an a animal that has been affected by this disease? Good question. Yeah, and like I said, it, it affects rabbits and they die very rapidly. So a lot of times there is no external sign like that, that bleeding from the mouth or the swelling that. So I will get brief quickly here to some signs internally when you're dressing your rabbit, that's when you're gonna have an opportunity to look for this disease. Um, and I'll also get to what you can do if, you, if you've got a rabbit that you, that you suspect could, could be infected, we, we do wanna know about that. So there's no vaccine for this disease. And so there's no way to inoculate domestic rabbits, which makes it hard to protect wild rabbits in most areas. Um, so before I get to what to look for on the inside of the rabbit, um, precautions to take, and this is pretty generic, but it relates to, to this new virus. Always wear uh, just gloves when you're dressing a rabbit. The disposable latex gloves work great. Um, like I said, you're going to watch for those signs of bleeding or swelling, anything like that unusual. Um, if it's... Uh, a normal rabbit, um, you know, bury any uh, remains from the dressing the rabbit on site. Um, now we're getting to, sorry, did I move the, okay. Okay, lost the slide there. Um, if you have a, a carcass that you uh, suspect might be contaminated, I'll get to the reporting, um, part of that, but you wanna handle a carcass like that a little bit more carefully. Um, anything that you use to bury the animal, you wanna disinfect. A 10% bleach solution works really well for any of this. Alcohol also works, um, but you know, for things like your shovel, your feet, your footwear, anything like that, uh, the bag, if you're bagging the animal, you can, you can use a 10% bleach solution. Uh, if you're in a place that's where you can bury that animal and it's not an animal that you want to test, that's our recommendation from the department. There are other options depending on where you are. Um, so here we are with reporting. Um, for wild rabbits that you suspect, uh, we want them reported to our wildlife investigations lab and that's this number at the top. Uh, the Department of Agriculture also has a reporting mechanism in place for domestic rabbits. Uh, they also have a quarantine in place, so we should be aware of where the disease is occurring and take all these precautions. Um, one other uh, virus that you should be aware of it doesn't it's not a common virus there's only roughly 200 cases reported annually but uh, tularemia or rabbit fever you've probably heard of rabbit fever occurs pretty much throughout the world and likewise can enter as either uh, an aerosol a, a 
uh, body fluid or even dust or dander. It can be spread also by uh, ticks, deer flies, and fleas, and it does also survive in the soil. So here's where we want to, uh, sorry, one more slide. Um, and it's, it's fatal in humans if not treated. Um, I'm not going to go, it basically has flu-like symptoms that deteriorate fast if you don't get antibiotics. And so what to look for? When you're dressing a rabbit, you want to be looking at these internal organs to make sure that they likewise uh, look healthy, like the outside of the rabbit. Uh, you're looking for uh, excessive swelling of organs. Uh, the liver is the most important organ to take a look at. Here we see a healthy liver, a bright red and even red. Uh, this is a liver that's diseased with uh, tularemia, uh, which is this rabbit fever. But this is uh, also a, an indicator for the RHDB2. Uh, you're gonna look for a swollen or uh, discolored liver. So when you're inside dressing a rabbit, you wanna make sure, take special care and, and examine the, the liver. Um, last disease I wanted to talk about is plague. It's a, a bacteria. Uh, occurs naturally throughout the West and is spread by primarily uh, ticks and fleas. Uh, and, and you can get it also by touching a, a dead animal, an infected animal, inhaling if a person or a pet has it by, in, by just the same way COVID spreads by inhaling droplets. Uh, so how, when you're hunting with your dog, it's something to be aware of. It uh, comes on just like the flu again. Uh, with plague, particularly the bubonic plague, usually is the, the variety of plague that we would get. And it ends with uh, a really swollen, um, well, the, the last symptom before you'll be headed to the hospital fast is this very swollen lymph node. And if not treated rapidly, uh, it, you can, you'll be uh, in a world of hurt and it ends in death. Um, the good part of this is that plague is, is a, is, a, is a bacterial disease that, that has definable outbreaks in places and in times. So if you've been following the news for a lot of years, you probably remember uh, this being in the news in the mid 2000s. And again, in the uh, 2015, uh, occurs in locales. So the Southwest is a hot spot, although we do have uh, scattered cases throughout the state. Again, with plague, as with these other diseases I mentioned today, there's some real easy ways you can protect yourself. Uh, that's wear gloves when you're dressing your rabbit. Make sure your rabbit looks healthy on the outside. Uh, that's normal behavior. Uh, any uh, sign of visible ulcers or bleeding. Uh, if a rabbit has a really excessive parasite load that looks like unhealthy, this rabbit's not long for the world. That's a that's a that's a tip off. And again, when you're dressing your rabbit, just make sure the inside also looks healthy and cook the rabbit meat to 160. And all of these um, diseases that we talked about are rendered. Most of them don't affect, uh, I'm sorry, well, the RHDB2 doesn't even affect humans that we know of, but both the viruses and the um, plague bacteria are rendered um, you know, ineffective against, uh, they won't infect you if, if you cook that meat to 160. Really, really good question too that came in, Matt, is, is there a particular species of rabbit or hare that um, is more susceptible or carriers of these diseases? Well, I mean, for they, any of the rabbit species I talked about can carry plague. Um, obviously the, the desert cottontail would be the most common species that would be associated with plague. Usually plague is, begins as an outbreak with, uh, with, with, uh, burn, with uh, rodents, denning rodents like uh, squirrels, squirrels, ground squirrels and whatnot. But um, yeah, so any of them potentially, you know, throughout our state in particular, um, with, um, with rabbit fever, I don't know, I don't believe that it would discriminate either. And the RHDB2 certainly does not. It attacks all rabbits that we know of. All right. Thank you.
how many more slides you got there? Sorry, uh, that was that was my last slide. All right. So I'll go ahead and stop your share and I'll finish up. And uh, okay. if you guys have any questions on stuff that Matt's covered, go ahead and send them in. But I'm going to cover a little bit on hunting uh, regulations and make it quick for you so we can get you to dinner. All right. So. So as far as requirements for hunting uh, here in California, this is about one of the only game species you can actually hunt that doesn't require a tag or stamp. All you need is your current hunting license. So yippee, right? So that, that'll be great. Um, as far as the season goes, uh, jackrabbit is open all year round, uh, but actually cottontail and bearing hair, they open next, next week on July 1st. Okay, the season goes to the last Sunday in January. Um, that's for the general season, which is covers kind of all methods of take, except for falconry, which you can uh, do if you're falconry only. Um, for cottontails and such, you have to go through, um, you can hunt after January 30th. From the 31st to March 20th, you're still eligible to hunt with falconry. And when it comes to limits, you have uh, a limit of five with a daily possession of 10. Uh, with jackrabbits, there's no limit no or possession limit, which means you can have as many as you can use. Um, if you were to waste them, you could be wasting game. So we don't want that to happen. So just take what you can use. Don't, don't exceed that. Um, there is one area in the state of California where you can't hunt rabbits, such as cottontail or brush rabbits, and this is what uh, Matt was talking about with the brush rabbit that is uh, protected. This is an area, it's north of Tracy and west of Manteca and Lathrop along the San Joaquin River. Um, there's a boundary listed in the regulations that tells you where this is at. This is a general overview of it. It's basically south of the old river um, uh, down to a certain slough. You need to know where those points are, but if you're anywhere close, don't shoot a cottontail or a brush rabbit. Uh, best off just to stay out of that area. When it comes to shooting hours, uh, luckily we're able to take uh, rabbits one half hour before sunrise to one half hour after sunset. Those are active periods, so that really helps. Um, when it comes to method of take, you can use shotguns, muzzle loaders, uh, muzzling shotguns, falconry, bow and arrow. Uh, air rifles, pistols and rifles, crossbows, and you can use dogs too. Uh, but also, always, always, always check the method restrictions for the area that you're going to. Um, some of our wildlife areas, they are open to hunting for rabbits, but you must use a shotgun or uh, you can't have any air rifles or pistols or uh, any regular rifles there. So make sure you know um, the restrictions for the game that you can take on that area and um, the method of take. Uh, when we're looking to go out rabbit hunting based on what we learned tonight and their biological activities, we wanna pursue them during their higher activity periods, which are morning and evening. Uh, this will help our encounter of those animals. Look for sign like pellets. You're gonna see, uh, I learned something new with uh, when it came to the rabbits re-ingesting their pellets. You can see some white ones here. I don't really see any you know, recent ones, but if you're in a rabbit area, you'll see high density of pellets in those areas. Uh, cottontails basically like cover. They like heavy cover. So walk edges of heavy cover, uh, wood brush piles, berry hedges, all those type of areas where they can get good overhead cover. They like being able to run back into thick cover to avoid either birds of prey or any other type of animals that may be chasing them. So look for those hedge type areas where they can get good overhead cover. Um, basically when they're relaxing, sometimes they're gonna be right at the edges of that cover in the shade, uh, just sitting there. When they're not feeding, they're gonna be looking out for you know predators and, and such. So that's the areas you can kind of target. Sometimes you may only get a glimpse of them, but if you have a dog that can maybe flush them out of a, a hide, uh, that might be, you know, beneficial, but always be, be careful of where your dog is and make sure you have a good safe shot. 
that's what you're going to use as a tactic. Um, keep going the wrong way. As far as uh, types of cover, uh, I took some of these pictures in this area here in the grasslands where I live, Los Banas. There's a couple of plants that, in this area that harvest, I mean, that harbor a bunch of cottontails and, and quail and all types of other game. One's called Atriplex. It's a really big uh, bush that sometimes it's going really nice, lush and green, but sometimes you'll see uh, it with a bunch of dead, dead sticks and stems. All of those uh, animals love to hide underneath these. They use it for escape, um, but you'll see them always on the edges of these type of uh, plants. The other one is uh, tamarisk, which is also known as the salt cedar. Um, there's a lot of these little groves out in certain areas uh, on our wildlife areas or in the forest because these all these plants thrive in uh, low um, water areas, alkali soils, areas where they, you'll, you will find rabbits. So they provide shade, um, they provide cover for animals uh, such as the rabbits that we're seeking. So try to find those type of um, growths. Um, another place you can get is near ag lands, okay? There's farms, uh, a lot of farmers consider cottontails pests. Uh, so if you were to ask a farmer who has a melon field, a alfalfa field, and they have some type of wooded area next to that area where, uh, where rabbits might be hiding, coming to and from, uh, that could be an area you could get some permission to hunt because you might be doing that farmer a favor. But make sure you get permission first, because some farmers resort to poison, and you don't want to be shooting poisoned uh, uh, rabbits. So make sure you get permission from that farmer first. Also, if they have an old boneyard where they keep all their old equipment, um, old wood pallets, anything of the old materials that rabbits can hide in, that could be a perfect opportunity to go in there with a pellet gun. You can you know, get permission. Say, hey. Uh, I'm looking to do some harvest some rabbits, and um, I see you have a bone bone yard over there, and, and I would love to be able to take take care of those rabbits for you, so they don't bother your crops, and and present that you have a pellet gun. It's not going to be any uh, thing that damages equipment or such, so that could be an opportunity for you to harvest uh, some to go out hunting for some cottontails. And do they really taste like chicken? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, a lot of people prefer to have their rabbits, um, you know, oven fried, pan fried, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. I'm going to send you some links for how to take care of your rabbits, um, but go ghoul it. Um, and, and yes, it may be a little bit tougher, but they are, they are tasty. Uh, they're very mild meat. Um, you might even want to try jackrabbit, okay? Uh, it, looking at some of the Google, um, I mean, the what's called YouTube videos today that had uh, comparisons of jackrabbit versus cottontail. Uh, a lot of people said that the jackrabbit was actually very good and heck, they're a lot bigger. So some people are uh, bound and fixed to go ahead and go after jackrabbit. So those are the things we want to present to you. I did include some links that I will email to you um, shortly. And I just want to tell you, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Matt, thank you for your presentation. I'm sure you gave people a lot of information that they wouldn't even considered or thought of before. And it gave them a good, better understanding of what California species we have available for them to pursue out there. So thank you, Matt. And uh, I see a one question or chat. Let me see, there's a thank you. I'll make sure I get them all. What time of day did you say desert cottontail were more active again? That's going to be in the mornings and evenings, right, Matt? Yes. Hey, Sean, there was a question about shot size. And what shot size. Shot okay, the, the shot size, you can't exceed, um, what is it, number two or BB? BB. Can't exceed BB size. But more ideally for rabbits, you probably want to use like a size six or four when pursuing them in the field. Um, you're going to take your shots, whatever your effective range is, uh, usually within 30 or 40 yards. You don't want to exceed that. Uh, basically, um, if you're going to use a rifle, it's always nice to be able to take rifle shots or pistol shots or air rifle shots where you can shoot the head. Uh, that way you don't mess up any very much of the meat. 
when you shoot with the shotgun, you want to make sure you don't shoot them too close because that can also make you have meat loss while you're um, on your harvest. So um, thanks for that. Uh, a lot of thank yous, chokes, uh, whatever works for your, for your gun. Basically go out there and pattern it. I would say a modified choke would be efficient. Um, you don't wanna use a full choke when you're using steel shot because you have to use non lead shot when you're hunting all um, um, game in California. If you're in other states where you still allow lead, uh, a modified choke will still work and the same shot sizes, size six, size four, will be definitely a good shot size to use. Um, that's about it. All right. I don't see any other questions come in. This will be recorded and hopefully be out within the next couple of days. Uh, if you um, want to share it with somebody, please do. Uh, please tell them about us and thank you for joining us. So that's all I have for you tonight. Uh, thank you. And we will see you next time. Bye.